Thank you for joining us again in this video series. Now I would like to show you how lists, rule sets, and devices work. For the relationship thinkers, this will be a piece of cake. We start with domains, or even fully qualified domains, and when we have one or more in a group, we call it a list or a rule. Many different lists or rules can make up a single rule set. And finally, a rule set is what you apply to a device at layer two or three. Now, back to lists. Since they are the basic building block of the software stack, I would like to cover off how they work. Each line in a list consists of a partially qualified domain, often expressed as a PQDN, or a fully qualified domain, often written as FQDN. Furthermore, each list is treated in its entirety to either exclude subdomains or include subdomains. For example, www.google.com is a subdomain of google.com. Each list in its entirety also has a type attribute that determines how it is applied. The types are white, black, rainbow, and authoritative lists. Now, white lists are used only in a methodology that we call block all, allow some. When a rule set is based on white lists, that's the only time when white lists apply. There are also verified white lists available for otherwise difficult services to list, such as the requirements for iOS iMessages to work. Now, blacklists apply to any type of rule set, and essentially they override white lists in the event of a conflict. And as the name applies, blacklisting a domain means that it will be blocked. Rainbow lists also apply to any rule set. You will use this type of list to redirect domains for a DNS resolution to an alternate DNS server. The typical use case for this is in Active Directory, where you want AD authoritative domains forwarded to the AD servers. Rainbow lists are also used when a single or few exceptions need to be made from a managed blacklist, such as a third-party ad networks list. The authoritative list responds with simple IPv4A records to easily facilitate authoritative DNS, as well as what we call split DNS zones. This is where you have a public DNS record resolving to your public IP, but on your internal network, you wish to have it resolved internally. These lists can also be shared with other sites running this software. Each list has a share URL that is available to be subscribed to or copied by the recipient of that shared URL. The managed lists are also part of the subscription service and include groups such as third-party ad networks and trackers. Now, when you have a conflict of a domain being listed in multiple list types, consider the following order of operations. First authoritative, then rainbow, then black, and then white. As soon as a hit is found, the order of operations stops. Now, not all rules or list types apply to all types of rule sets. Refer to your documentation to see why white lists, for example, are only available on rule sets based on white lists. Now, when an end user sees a block page, by default, the unblock request button only appears when the end user device is treated with a rule set based on white lists. And if you've been looking at the live log, you may have wondered what the public suffix check is all about. In order to prevent private DNS leakage, all internet bound DNS queries are validated against the current public suffix list available from publicsuffix.org. Now, how domains are blocked. When this software stack blocks access to a domain, it does not respond with NX domain. Instead, each DNS query is answered with a local internal private IPv4 address selected during the software stack installation. This allows for a user-friendly block page to appear for devices that have a browser. So traditionally, this was a problem for SSL sites, which conveniently we fixed by using a browser extension that we call Block Page Assistant. Now, onto creating and managing rule sets. Think of each rule set as a policy. Each rule set is made up of a number of rules or lists, each of which is either off or on, as you can see in this example. 
The following four types of rule sets are available. Sets based on white, black, unfiltered, or scheduled sets. While the first three are more obvious, the scheduled rule set is suited for time of day settings. A security conscious example may be that during non-working or during maintenance hours, Windows devices have access to nothing else except Windows, security, and application updates, for example. As for rule set assignments, each device is represented with its own unique MAC address when enrollment is automated. The way that devices are enrolled and named is fully automated. Normally, no action is required as devices are listed automatically by their broadcast name, such as Johnny's iPhone. However, if broadcast names are not visible to the filtering stack, it falls back to the manufacturer of the MAC address. These are some samples that you will see in use. Having the MAC address visible provides you with the best ability to follow the device to ensure that the right policy is applied regardless of its IP address now or in the future. Check the documentation for some troubleshooting tips for better Layer 2 visibility. Now allow me to show you the accounts user interface, the locations, and administrative users area. Each account represents a different billing arrangement, while each location represents a public internet exit point. However, from a single administrative account, all of that user's authorized accounts and locations are available for administration purposes. Furthermore, each location within the same account shares the same administrative access, and all locations within that same account also have one common set of rules or lists. However, each location, even within the same account, carries distinct rule sets. Additional administrative users can easily be added with a simple email invitation, as you can see here. Thanks for tuning into this video. Please check out other resources in this series. Mm -hmm.